Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, and welcome here to First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in Columbus, Ohio, for this service of morning prayer and communion. Each week we gather for prayer and song and scripture and communion to celebrate God's presence among us. Later in the service, as we do every Sunday at this service, we celebrate communion. So I invite you to have those elements at hand, bread or juice or something common to your household that can serve that purpose. I'm the Reverend Emily Krause Corzine, Associate Minister. I'm joined by Senior Minister Tim Ahrens and Minister of Music Kevin Jones. We're glad you have joined us here at First Church. You can find worship materials on our worship page of the website www.first-church.org. We are a growing and vibrant community of faith rooted in the social gospel and witnessed to justice and mercy here in our community and in the world. So if you're looking to work for issues of justice, to serve those in need or grow in your own faith, deepen your connection to this faith community, please check us out on our website or follow us on Facebook. Um, People of God, let us turn our hearts toward the sacred. Let us lean on the beauty of worship and lend our voices in prayer and song. Let us support one another during these times. Let us worship God. Please join me in the opening sentences. Send out your light and your truth, that they may lead me. And bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. O God, open our lips. And our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Praise to the holy and undivided Trinity, one God. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
Good morning, First Church. My name is Brittany Strickland Hilliard, and I've been a member since 2018. I am here with Lee Briggs to welcome you to the kickoff of the 2021 Stewardship Campaign. Our theme this year is Power of the Plate, Love and Generosity. We've seen a lot of love and generosity over the past few months during this challenging time, and we want to and continue that love and support throughout this 2021 campaign. Our annual campaign goes to support so many different areas of our mission and ministry. This includes worship, music, faith formation, and congregational care, the building, and of course, our lovely staff who make the ministries of this church happen. Our offering plate, which looks like this, does benefit, does benefit a lot, but the giving is very broad. As I mentioned before, my husband and I are both newish members to the church, and we had our first child last year. During that life-changing experience, we found an outpouring of love and support from the First Church community, including this beautiful blanket provided by the First Church quilters. From that point on, we felt a continued pride and need to support First Church and their mission and to pr that provides to the community. I encourage you to be part of this year's campaign in support of First Church. I now will pass the plate, pass the plate to Lee. Thank you, Brittany. Um, I'd like to share a little bit about my story uh, in First Church. I started attending here and visiting about 18 months ago, a little bit more than that. And then a year ago, last fall, I joined the church. But when I think about the 18 months when I was visiting, what kept drawing me back were the excellent sermons, um, the over-the-top pipe organ and, and choral anthems, and also the warm greeting that I received from the ministerial staff, as well as members and the ushers as I arrived. Um, it meant the world to me. Um, in the years since I've been a member, um, I've helped with Laundry Love, I'm serving with Bread, and um, I sang for Kevin Jones and um, am now singing in the choir. Um, the power of the plate, love and generosity, as uh, Brittany said, is our theme. Um, in the next couple of weeks, or shorter amount of time, you'll be receiving a letter and pledge card. It'll be arriving soon. Um, don't mistake it for a mail-in ballot. Even though it is kind of a ballot, a mail-in ballot for First Church, for sure. Um, the campaign will go until November 30th. Um, the Stewardship Committee and Church Council is working to set the 2021 budget. Thank you in advance for investing in the ministry and mission of First Congregational Church. Good morning to everyone. Good morning to the adults and children. It is good to do a children's time. It's been like a long time since I've done a children's time. And I was thinking about something I wanted to share with you today. So I'm going to put this up here. Okay, it's a little picture of Timmy. When Timmy was very little, he was five. This is a young me. And so there I am in my pajamas. And that, for those who do not know what you're looking at, that's a record player with a needle. Now, Emily, you know what one is, right? I, I know Kevin would know. <laughs> so, so this is a record player with a needle on it. And so you would put the record on and it would turn around and you'd listen to it. So here's what I want to tell you. I learned to sing in church. I learned at a very early age, if I wanted to make noise in church, I had to be singing to do it. So I would do anything I could to recite prayers or perhaps sing a song or hymn uh, so that I could make noise in church, right? I didn't know at the time that I was giving glory to God, but that translated into loving music all my life. And this is where my mother would put me when I was a little too loud or raucous. She would put me by my record player and give me a stack of records. And I would play for hours and sing along in a far corner of the house where I wouldn't bother anybody, right? You can only imagine. <laughs> you guys laughing about me? Anyway, so the reason I'm telling you this is because 
I think it's very important in this time that we're apart that you spend this time with yourself in song and so that you're learning to sing. We have the hymns every week and these, at, at this service we have repetitive hymns. So these are things that you're hearing all the time and you get to sing them and hear them. Sing them through the week. Uh, play this back during the week. Get used to the singing of the glory of God. And as you do, the rest of your singing will come naturally. Now, as you grow, Mr. Jones will tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, ready for the choir? That's another story. But I want you to know that this is where you learn to sing. Church is where you learn to sing. And so I hope that you spend this time singing to your heart's desire. Sing with everything you've got. Learn the, the, the words of the, of the hymns, learn the tunes of the hymns, learn all of this, and have fun doing it. Take time away from other people to just simply be by yourself and sing, sing, sing. Okay, have a great week, and may God bless you. I'm not going to sing my prayer, but I am going to say it. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for song that encourages us to give you glory, to open our lungs, to enjoy the, the, the breath that you give us, and to share everything we have from the heart of our love with you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, beginning in the 32nd chapter, the first verse. Listen for the word of God. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us, who shall go before us as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of Egypt. We do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it into a mold, and cast an image of a calf. They said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them and my, I may consume them. And of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, It was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. 
Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 22. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burnt their city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him out into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Jesus is not known for his soft introductions. Jesus is not known for his smooth transitions. Jesus isn't even known for his reasonable sayings. Hear these words from Jesus. Sell your possessions. Give the money to the poor. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. And the ever popular, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Today's lesson isn't any easier. A king throws a great big wedding feast for his son. Invited guests don't show up, and they act badly. So the king is enraged. He sends servants to get others so many can come and fill the banquet hall. They, those who are graciously invited get dressed up in their finest clothing and show up, except one. And the king graciously opens his home. And one shows up without the proper attire. Doesn't really adhere to any norm. But the king is furious over this one. And he asks the attendants to bind him hand and foot and throw him out into outer darkness, which is beyond the darkest dark of the darkest, darkest darkness, the outer darkness. And then he says these words. Jesus says, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus is sticking it to us here. Jesus concludes, for many are called, but few are chosen. Well, thanks, Jesus, for another riveting Sunday morning parable. Today, I want us to think together about what it means to respond to a generous invitation. Have you had an invitation to a fabulous event that you really wanted to go to, but your significant other didn't? Have you had a wonderful offer to participate in something extraordinary, but you couldn't quite let go of the commitment you had somewhere else? Have you had that invitation to a wedding and chosen not to go in some sort of protest or out of hurt or disagreement because of a relationship? What if we were to think of this banquet set before us, not as a wedding banquet, which was obviously a big, big occasion in the first century, but instead we were to think of it as a thanksgiving, a thanksgiving banquet, where Jesus is offering up this extravagant welcome of a God who is generous and suggesting that many show gratitude in response. This is not one of the easier messages from Jesus. What do we do with the gracious invitation? How do we respond, or do we even show up? Or do we walk away and turn our backs? If you read on in the Gospel of Matthew, you hear how Jesus is under extreme pressure from religious leaders. They're trying to trap him. And Jesus, here at a critical moment in his ministry, is where he's trying to get God's message to any and all who would hear of this opportunity to respond to a hospitable and generous God. It's like Jesus is suggesting that we should show up, that we should accept an invitation like the one the king is offering in our passage. Jesus is suggesting that the opportunity to feast with God is so wonderful that we wouldn't want to miss it. It's God's invitation. It's God's invitation to be part of the kingdom of God. If the first individuals who are invited to the wedding don't show up and they walk away, God is going to say, find other people and open the doors and welcome them in. Good or bad, scripture says. Let them come into the feast. In all of God's um, fortitude in this moment, in all of what we might consider wrath, I mean, we, we, we kind of hear that God is a little angry 
in these moments, and the way that he's treating these individuals, this king image, right? It's almost like God is greedy for those who, want, who, who, who don't even know that this wedding banquet is coming. But God says, go, the king says, go and get these individuals and bring them in. It's almost like God is greedy as many people, to get as many people to come in as possible. He's really forceful about that. To make the kingdom image that Jesus describes a reality, where those who may not have been first on the list, they now have a prominent place at the table. Where those who were once cast aside, they get a chance to come in. This Thanksgiving banquet is a feast that means that we have to be aware of an invitation that may come. It's the kingdom of God here at hand as this big wedding feast. It's God offering a beautiful and plentiful opportunity to rejoice in the bounty of God's kingdom, that we might have a chance to feast at that table. And when we return our thanks and when we show up for God, we have a chance to see the goodness and the wideness of God's mercy and God's great vision for a world where all are welcome and all are included. That is the kingdom come here on earth. So I once preached at a, 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 another church and I ran into a woman before the worship service. And I said, how are you doing? And, and she said, absolutely fabulous just like that and I said whoa well that re that requires a follow-up response why is life so good well she explained that she quit her job and the one with the big salary and the big responsibilities the job that she hated that sucked the time and energy from that which she loved she took a large pay cut because she was working a more now she was working a more manageable number of hours in a job that can use her gifts, leaving her ample time and energy for other commitments in her life. When economic decisions were rooted in her and in our deepest values, when they are connected to our relationship with God, our lives are better. When we are familiar with the alternative to that life, when we struggle to make more money or buy a bigger house or fill, more, fill our lives with more possessions, we all know that at the end of the day, such a life does not and cannot satisfy us. We know that a good life is a life which is rooted in our deepest values, shaped by those things that are most important to us and that deeply connect us to our Lord God. God wants us to have a good life, and that is why I think God is so greedy to get all of those possible people to the feast. He wants as many people, God wants as many people as possible around that table. So keep in mind that God is generous to us, generous beyond our imagining, generous in granting us life and then showering us with love and grace and forgiveness and salvation and meaning. God is so generous, but God is also kind of greedy because he wants all of us. God wants all of us. There is no corner of our lives that God does not want to be a part of. And that's good news, because when we get God's comfort and wisdom and guidance in every part of our lives, God's presence doesn't come with strings attached. Maybe a few strings attached. We are responsible to a God for how we live every aspect of our to me, that's what stewardship is all about. And this Sunday, we're kicking off the fall stewardship campaign for 2021. It's not just about the 10% of our income that we may or may not give away. It's about the 100%, the totality of our lives, whether we live that life obedient to God. So you may have figured that I'm going to talk about stewardship that this is a stewardship sermon in some way. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about giving to God and giving to the church of Jesus Christ. It's been a practice in the Christian church since the very beginning 
that members of a faith community share some of their resources to support the church and its mission. And every church member and friend, those near and far, are asked to help contribute their gifts. So this morning, I ask each and every one of you to make a commitment to support this place at First Congregational Church and its mission with our gifts of time and energy and money. As to what that commitment is, well, that's up to you and God. God knows what you're up against. God knows how busy you are. God knows about the downturn in the economy and this great global pandemic that we face. God knows that some of you are out of work or underemployed or fearful of losing a job. God knows that you have kids who need clothes and braces and books. God knows how much college costs these days. God knows that some of us are on fixed incomes. God knows that there are other organizations out there that have captured your heart and that you need to give time and money to them too. God knows all of that stuff. The only one you need to please with the pledging decision is God. This God knowing everything is a mixed bag. Keep in mind, God knows other things as well. God knows how much stuff we have, how much money we make, how much we spend on ourselves and how much we give away. God knows how much money we spent last year going out to eat. God knows the total of my yearly satellite television bill. God, and again, the only one who needs you need to please in that decision is God. So when it comes to your pledge, God wants you to make a prayerful and thoughtful, faith-led decision that reflects on the fullness of your life. And then God... God wants you to apply that attitude to every economic decision that you make. So don't be fooled. When you figure out what you are going to pledge next year, you are not done wrestling with the issue of money and faith. We are never done wrestling with the issue of money and faith. And that's the way God wants it. Because God is not content with just 10% of our lives like those who weren't invited to the wedding banquet but got front row seats. They were all invited in. God wants all of our lives. Because God is not content with 10% of our lives. God wants all of our lives. And with what do we return our thanksgiving? All of ourselves, our whole lives, our loving in generosity, that enlivens our spirits and enriches our life together. May we always respond to the generous God who first gave to us. God be with you, and also with you, that there may be purpose and fulfillment, O oh God, in all that we do. That we may show others this day the love that you have taught us. Christ mercy. That the church throughout the world may respond to your call for peace and justice. Christ mercy. That those who are in need be helped and comforted. Christ have mercy. We lift up this day the special needs of our lives, of our families, of this congregation, of our friends, of our co workers, of our community, our state, our nation our world as we turn our thoughts to God. And I would invite everyone 
in the stillness of this moment to lift the names of those that are on your heart and mine. For all the prayers of our hearts, we ask that you hear us, Lord, for you do know our hearts that we may be strengthened by your grace for the tasks of this day. Christ, have mercy. Let us pray the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, we pray for your guidance in all our days, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, create in us care for each other as we walk in the path of truth and light. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hi, my name is Lauren Muscat, and I'm the Justice and Mercy Commissioner here at First Congregational. I wanted to share with you some of the work that Brett has been doing, even in these difficult and unprecedented times. Brett has organized actions throughout the summer in support of racial justice in Columbus, even securing a meeting with Mayor Ginther to share Brett's roadmap for change in Columbus. We are gearing up for the annual assembly on November 9th, where member congregations will decide what issues we'll champion in the coming months. You can help support the work of justice by contributing to today's mission offering and by participating in Bread's virtual annual assembly on November 9th. Thank you for your generosity and commitment to justice. And so Bread is a movement of change for social justice here in Columbus. And we've been a part of it now for 20 years. So let us be generous in sharing this morning's offering with Bread and to share our continuing offerings for the ministry and mission of First Church. Please designate where your gift is going. Thank you and thanks be to God.
Coffee tables in many of our homes now are communion tables on Sunday morning. That's right. The places closest to the TV or maybe closest to the laptop have become the place where we gather with the elements that God calls us to gather, bread and wine or grape juice, and we celebrate communion together. Things have changed. They'll return, but right now they may be different than we've experienced ever before. But here is what we are called to do by God, where two or three, and I would say we've got three and four and more, gather around the table of grace. We know that God is present there. That's really reassuring. As we come to the table today, let us come not because we must, but because we may. Let us not come with all of the answers to the questions of faith, but just bringing ourselves just as we are. Let us come then and be with Christ at his table a victory. Let us be with him at his table of grace. Please pray with me. Gracious God, as we gather at your table, wherever your table is this morning, we ask that you send your spirit upon us and the gifts that we have to share with one another, to share with you. And we ask that you strengthen us in our gathering and in our going forth. May we give more glory to you in this day and in the days ahead than ever before. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took bread, and after he blessed it, he broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he poured out the cup and said, Drink this, all of you. This is the new and the everlasting covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. By the power of your Holy Spirit, bless these gifts, O Lord. And as we come to your table, bless us in receiving them. We pray this through Christ. Amen. Take and eat, take and drink. Let us join together in the post-communion prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence in the simplicity and splendor of this holy meal. Unite us with all who are fed by Christ's body and blood, that we may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love, and that your universal church may be a rainbow of hope in an uncertain world. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, Amen. I invite you to hear these messages today as we depart to serve. In preparing to depart, we as a faith community have heard the word, shared the bread and cup, and are now called to respond and serve. There are many ways to serve our neighbors and this faith community during this time of pandemic. So please, Watch for your emails, open 
your emails. Look at the church website and Facebook for updates concerning our faith community and how we will organize to help those in need in our time of pandemic. Let us remember, and just a reminder for you, that all worship will continue to be online until we give you further notice, no in-person worship. And please note all the virtual studies and meetings that are being offered this week and the upcoming Bread House Meetings and the Book Club. Faith Formation is online this week with exciting possibilities and opportunities for learning and growing in our faith. The Pre-K through 5th Grade Wednesday Connections is in the form of vid video posted on Facebook each Wednesday and is for families to view at their convenience. We're trying to do this to not add to a load, but add to your growth. Youth Connections is on Sunday evenings at 6.30, and our formative discussions for adults are held throughout the week. I'm leading a midweek and mid-morning uh, on Wednesday study, and then on Monday evenings, a study called How to Be an Anti-Racist. Everyone's welcome. There are details in the Depart to Serve on how to participate. If you need to be in touch with Reverend Corzine or myself for emergency pastoral care or a name for the prayer list, please call 614-733-4547. This number is also listed in Depart to Serve. Just a reminder that your giving can be done through PayPal or Easy Tithe or simply by writing a check and sending it in. No matter how you are giving, be sure to mark it for either the mission of the week or the regular church ministry and mission and budget. If you have not done so, please like us on the First Church Facebook page, and there will be numerous postings uh, during this time for engagement, activities, devotion. Please monitor again your email, the Facebook page, and the church website. Are you hearing this? We keep saying it. We invite you now to join us in a virtual coffee hour after today's service, and you can find the link in Depart to Serve. Just click on the link and it'll take you right to coffee hour. Now, let us sing the closing hymn as we depart with a heart to serve. Thanks be to God. trusting in the abundance and the generosity of God so that you may also return to God out of generosity and love. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.